I really want to encourage people to, to feel that we should always remain with the heart of being a student and want to learn. And it, it inspires us. It, it enlivens us. Hello there, this is Oren Kiviti at Japanese Acupuncture Today. Welcome to the show, and today we're going to be talking about moxibustion. I'm joined today by Paul Movsesian, one of the big wheels of Australian Japanese acupuncture and moxibustion. So without further ado, Paul, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yes, yeah, so I probably fell into the whole East Asian medicine model like probably a lot of people which is i was sick i am um, traveling around nepal and uh, there was a yogi that was there that found me i was it was a pretty drastic story actually because i nearly died and he um he basically saved my life using um acupuncture and tibetan oil and water massage and things like that and and uh, uh, within a week, I was able to be river rafting down the Himalayan rivers again after not being able to walk. And I, when I came back to Australia, I was so interested in, um, in, this, in this medicine that he had used to make me feel so well. And that's how I found Chinese medicine. And, and from Chinese medicine, I slowly developed an interest in the acupuncture side more and more. What was it that drew you to Japanese acupuncture and moxibustion in particular? Well, it was initially the discovery that there was a whole other system beyond TCM. Uh, TCM at the time in those years were making the, uh, the rounds in the colleges uh, being established as the fundamental teaching model. And if you didn't know any better, you, you, know, you, you basically thought that that was the traditional model that had always been practiced. And then I discovered a, another college that was teaching traditional acupuncture. And within that meridian therapy model, there was also an emphasis on, uh, on j certain Japanese uh, systems. So Japanese acupuncture was coming out of Japan at the time within that area of Boston, Massachusetts, and so on. And so I was very fortunate there. I landed in an area where I wanted to start start to study this. I pursued um, training. I went to the New England School of Acupuncture to try to do courses and classes there to the Boston Shiatsu College. I was exposed to Stephen Birch and Junko Ida, Kiko Matsumoto. Uh, Leon Hammer lived in um, the same town as me, so we became um, friends and I, I studied uh, his pulse method of Dr. Shen's uh, pulse taking method and I decided to pursue more and more uh, visiting prayer practitioners from Japan were coming to uh, the US and I was exposed to them and uh, little by little I embraced uh, originally what I was most interested in which was Dr. Manaka's work and polarity medicine and then that led me to the marine therapy and the marine therapy led me to the moxa. And when did you start teaching this stuff, Paul? When I returned back to Australia in uh, 96, uh, there was no, um, 90, sorry, 97, I think was, uh, I came back to Australia and there was no Japanese systems here, really. Kiko Matsumoto had just visited and I was fortunate that uh, Stephen Birch had encouraged me to, to start teaching Dr. Manaka's model and Slowly from there, we created a, a, a postgraduate course that took a year, and then we developed the Meridian Therapy course, and with my training in Toyohari allowed me to become a, a teacher and establish the Toyohari Association here with the uh, help of Ted Pearson, Dr. Ted Pearson and Michael Hook. And then uh, from there, the courses just kept snowballing and because I arrived at a time when nothing existed and I had gone and done all this training I'd never imagined I was going to be teaching I just thought I was going to come to my clinic and be very happy doing all these things in my clinic but somehow I was thrust into the into the forefront of of the whole thing and and um, became I guess one of the main advocates of promoting the Japanese system here. 
We're here today to talk primarily about moxibustion, but to my mind, there's already a lot of confusion when people talk about moxibustion as one monolithic thing, because there are lots of different kinds of moxibustion and different um, kinds of effects from moxibustion. So is it, can we say that moxa does the same thing, that all kinds of moxibustion do the same thing? So the beauty of moxa is that it always depends on what you're trying to do and also your circumstances and lastly the patient themselves so these things have to be adapted when when we think of uh, you know going back to the tcm training of moxa it had been primarily stick moxa which you were told you know you could do all these things with your with the stick moxa but th th that technique took a long time and the smoke and and the the heat it didn't really a, a address many other aspects that seem to exist in the moxa literature so you have to be able to recognize that depending on the methodology you're trying to apply and the patient's to ability to tolerate what you're about to do and your circumstances so for example let's say you're in a clinic that's a multidisciplinary clinic that doesn't allow smoke and there are in japan developments of electric moxa techniques and tdp lamps and you know all sorts of other ways you can get around that charcoal smokeless moxa and so forth if you're in a clinic where it's quite acceptable of course you've got other possibilities um, that are available to you as well as home recommendations which in japan of course was a very big and important part of moxa treatment uh, a little bit difficult to do that in the west but i guess it's a matter of educating patients and and assisting them to understand how to do this when should you use moxa and when should you use acupuncture because you know they're both using acupuncture points aren't they they are the the difference is probably found in the most basic quote that's describing acupuncture is more effective on the channel chi and moxa is delving deeper because of the nature of moxa the capacity of it to irradiate uh, this bandwidth in the farad spectrum of the inf in the infrared in the infrared band the farad spectrum it can go deeper and affect uh, the blood level. And so we can all, always uh, adjust this and extend it and say, well, the longer a problem has occurred uh, and existed, the, the more complicated and deeper and stuck the problem is. So moxa would definitely be more applicable. Not to say that moxa is not great in an acute situation. For example, food poisoning is a point under the sole of the foot, urinate, which is great for an acute scenario. But as a generalization, we could say that moxa is more effective in, in, the, um, in the more deeper chronic and, uh, and stuck blood stagnated conditions. Paul, could I interrupt you there for a minute and just get you to say a little bit more about the Farad lamps, because that's something that our viewers might not, might not be familiar with. When we look at the, the bandwidth of the heat spectrum, you know, from ultraviolet to infrared. So once we get to the infrared, there are these uh, bandwidths that are closer to the end of the infrared spectrum. And one of them is called the farad or near 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 infrared or near farad ra ra range of um, of uh, the bandwidth. It's very close to the body's own heat signature. It's the kind of heat our body's generating. So amazingly, moxa generates that ability to hit that bandwidth. So of all the plants. I mean, obviously, there are other plants that are used in moxa other than mugwort, but in general, mugwort has this amazing capacity. It resonates with that bandwidth. And so when we use it on the body, the body receives it remarkably well because it, it, it feels like it's its own heat source rather than applying, uh, you know, a hot poker or something like that. So they found that there are stones that generate this like tourmaline and jade and traditionally you'd find that jade could be placed 
on, on the chest, around the heart. And recent discoveries how, and research that's been done has shown that when our body heat hits the jade and the jade releases its, its Farad rays back into the heart, it stimulates the heart function and blood function and you know other qualities that are necessary for health. So what they have done in the TDP lamps is they've taken about 30 different stones that are of this quality, crushed them, put them over a hot plate, and so the plate gets heated and then that generates that heat to be able then to be received as a lamp. Uh, so you could put an acupuncture needle, put a lamp over it. You could use a shallow needle technique, for example, and put a lamp over it. And you'd be equating that to uh, Dr. Manaka's typical step two, where he would use uh, Kyoto Shin and warm, warm needle uh, rather than having a smoky needle or even the smokeless ones, which sometimes are difficult with some patients because Again, to get a perpendicular needle, deep needle, so that this can sit on it. For some people, they're very thin and their frame, their body frame doesn't receive that type of needling very well. So, again, you've got an alternative here. You can use this, this heat lamp. To tell you one other be beautiful discovery, too, that I've come across, which is uh, what they call a jade vitality mat, which is this beautiful mat that has almost 400 of these jade and tourmaline stones that, that, I, that I have on the bed. So the patient starts to receive this while I'm doing my front treatment. They receive this on the back already preparing the body. And the beauty of this mat is that it's not like an electric blanket, firstly, because of the type of heat it's generating, but secondly, because of the brilliant technology, which rather than using copper wiring, carbon fibers are used. So you don't get an EMF. So it doesn't disrupt your treatment, which is really lovely for the patient. It sounds like you're saying that, I mean, this is something that I talk about a lot anyway, is that all acupuncture does is it sends a signal to the body. It's not that the acupuncture does something to the body and it, it sends a signal to the body that triggers change. And what you're saying is that the frequency of light generated by Moxa is the same signaling um, frequency that the body uses anyway. So therefore it's really good to intermesh with the body. It's a really good way to talk to the body because it's already talking the same language. That's correct. You know, there are techniques that use uh, electric moxa, which generates the heat that uh, the moxa reaches in its temperature that they've measured. And that's a different effect again. I mean, you can mm. stimulate also just by the heat stimulation. But if you can use something that actually has the Farad spectrum or as moxa does, or as we were talking about the TDP lamps, then you're that much closer to the body receiving this in, in a much more therapeutic effect. Mm. Great, thank you. So what kinds of moxa are there and what kinds of moxa do you want to talk about? You are, you know, the, the spectrum of moxa is so amazing. Like I've had the joy to study with certain teachers, for example, uh, Shinma Sensei, who is Fukaya's son, who is Fukaya's son, and uh, he he and uh, the current person that runs that system, um, Tetsuya Fukushima, uh, is now running that protocol of the bamboo techniques. But then out of that were born other models where they were using. Um, uh, slotted bamboo so you can see what's happening under there you know and then you have uh, uh, people who've developed uh, modifications to the to the bamboo uh, you have uh, the capacity of using moxa to be used as a fumigation which is uh, kind of a lost art today but a very effective technique uh, you can use it for steaming uh, you can use it with um, an iron, hot iron, and putting in the punk moxa and then you know, ironing that and releasing that into the body. You've got, uh, of course, the ontake that you are so well known for. Um, uh, Hata Sensei from N Nepal, she's a Japanese teacher who developed this very hot moxa that burns around 800 degrees Celsius using a glove to impact and uh, press the moxa deep into the into the bones and into the tissues mm -hmm. you've got uh, techniques that work on the gums um, i was fortunate enough again to study 
um, this this uh, with uh, um, the Kochi tradition. He's a fifth century, a fifth generation, sorry, um, teacher from uh, his family lineage using uh, moxa on gum disease and teeth, tooth, tooth problems, dental abscesses and so forth. So we, we are um, probably so limited in the way we learn our moxa because, you know, with a stick, you can't do half of these things. With direct moxa, um, cone moxa, uh, you've got, uh, you know, variations of, again, of what you're trying to do with the impact of the size and the type of heat you're wanting to release, whether you want to tonify, disperse, even though moxa is used generally to, to, you know, to regulate. Um, and then all the types of developments that even existed in the pre-TCM, such as the moxa glasses, where you've got the, uh, the lovely walnuts that can be soaked in chrysanthemum mm -hmm. uh, tea, and then you can put moxa on the glasses of the walnuts and they look really funny, but they are phenomenal for eye disease. I, I remember many years ago when I was still living in the UK, I had a Qigong teacher from China and he made the point to the class. He said, Qigong just means cultivating qi. So there are so many different ways that you can cultivate qi that it doesn't make sense to talk about all of them as the same thing. You have to be very specific. It, and he, he used the analogy. He said it's like if you take champagne and Coca-Cola and water, they're all drink, but they're all very different kinds of drink. Mm. And I think that moxibustion is the same, that there are so many different ways of doing moxibustion. Some of them are direct. Some of them are indirect. Some of them involve pushing on the skin like on take or press moxa and some of them are directly on the skin you know with small cone moxibustion others are on a needle so there are so many ways of doing moxa so that when people talk about moxibustion they need to become very specific about what kind of moxibustion they're doing and talking about and what the effects of that moxa are that's um, correct mm. that's correct i mean it is it is a, a generic word, you know, to use the word moxibustion because it doesn't necessarily imply the same thing depending who's listening and what they've learned. It's mm -hmm. one of the first things that we have to clarify when we when we teach the workshops is you'll often get people who put their hand up and say, uh, when you say you're saying moxa, are you meaning direct direct moxa? You know, they don't they want to know what do I mean by by the word moxa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a um, Korean acupuncturist called Sung Baek who wrote um, a very influential small pamphlet about moxa a long time ago. And in that he he used an analogy. He said that needles move chi and bloodletting releases blood or takes energy out of the body and moxa puts energy into the body. And that's always been a concern for some students of mine. Um, particularly with the TCM uh, thinking about how if you have a hot condition, you can't put a hot stimulus on the body. Yeah. So if we're putting energy into the body with moxa, how can we treat hot conditions? You, you know, if you think about the idea uh, that fire is yang, so we have this idea that moxa is therefore yang, hence the numbers of moxa we usually use are odd because they're considered yang. But when we look at fire that's put under rice, we see that the rice starts to steam and this produces an effect in, in moistening and wetting. So the idea that fire is always going to you know, burn and destroy and you know, heat up rather than necessarily um, create an enlivening effect in the body, that's a very static model of the body. I think when we look at the training that we that we receive in our um, east asian medical model one of the things that i always recognize was we talk about yin and yang but we we never really think in really in terms of yin and yang when we come to treatment we treat in a very yeah, disease and you know, we want the person to get well so we, we, we you know we get a disease name and we want that to be well even if we call it something from an east asian diagnostic model you know but ideally the idea of seeing how yin is constantly transforming into yang and yang into yin and this is a really important aspect and so we have to recognize that the heat can generate um a kind of uh 
a moisture that rises, just like when water, um, when a hot hot uh, cement is hit with the rain and you see the steam rising and that steam is the moistening yin that produces the jin ye of the fluids of the body so you know so this is one way we can think of it another way that we can think of it is that the body is not hot necessarily all over i mean we may have cold buttocks cold knees um you know and so uh, to just say because one area of the body is hot that's another another problem that we have to surmount with this question about thinking that moxa is not appropriate. A third that's very important is to realize that we have the notion of what's called false heat or you know empty heat, which you can get in counter flow chi, and hence you have a school of herbalism that's designed around um, using heating herbs like futsu aconite when you have this false heat. So. These are these are all sort of various ways that we can we can think about this. The last one that I'd like to mention is when someone's dealing with uh, with the body that's uh, receiving maybe uh, a wind heat attack, and we would use Governor Vessel fourteen with direct moxa, which is the meeting point of all the yang, and we want to open that yang, all those yang channels to get that heat out, so we can use heat to release heat in the body. I think that's really interesting to think of it in a in those theoretical ways, uh, because people maybe don't really understand or haven't thought about yang and yin in those ways, but yang creates yin. Um, so if you're using something yang, then you're working to create yin or move yin. But I think also in very practical ways that I can, I, I imagine to myself that there's a spectrum of moxibustion techniques. And on the one side, there are these very strong techniques with the moxa box where, you know, you put the moxa box on someone's back and you light it and it gets so hot that you have to move it. So you yeah. wait till they say, yeah, oh, it's too hot. And then you move it and the skin goes red and then you move it again and it goes red. So that's really a heating technique. And, you know, there's no two ways about it. That's heating. That's but when right. you compare that with a small um, rice grain moxa cone, then that's not heating in the same way. It's stimulating. That's right. That's so right. we need to think about the technique itself. Um, I even sometimes I compare uh, warm needle technique in Chinese acupuncture and warm needle technique, you know, kutoshin in Japanese acupuncture. And they're very different techniques, even though they both involve sticking a needle into the skin and you put moxa on the skin, uh, on the needle. But yeah. the kind of moxa used is very different in one to the other. So one is less heating and one is more warming. That's right. And look, the, the, uh, what you're saying is totally correct because it's also about the quality of the moxa you're using as well. Like uh, you, you, you try to use a pure gold moxa that is used for rice grain and you try to put it onto a, a warm needle technique and it's not, going to, it, it's not going to do the correct technique because it's going to burn too quickly and it hasn't al allowed enough time to, to warm uh, that point or to generate that heat down the needle shaft. So, you know, choosing the right moxa, the right grade, the right technique that's appropriate for the person, the dosage that they're going to need, uh, these are all very, very important uh, aspects that have to be taken into consideration. And I think, again, most of the ideas about moxa exist because of either herbalism uh, or a stick moxa. And because stick moxa had no other option other than to be held there for a long time till it did heat up the body, then it's perceived that it's not appropriate uh, in, in, hot, in hot conditions because of the nature of, of how we see um, you don't want to apply hot for a hot condition, which is true in a, you know, in a, in the herbal sense, other than the than the the fi that uh, fire school of of herbalism, but but typically, yeah, you wouldn't want to give someone with a hot condition a heating herb. So mm -hmm. there's truth to it, but it just has to be fleshed out and understood correctly. And I think this is what's not really happening for a lot of people. There's a they they come away with these ideas, they become catchphrases, and and then they don't know how to investigate deeper. Mm, that's great. Thank you. So I hope that for people watching this, they now understand that, first of all, there's a whole spectrum of moxa from very, very hot techniques to very, very light and subtle techniques, and that not all of those techniques would be considered heating, particularly in the Japanese canon. 
And then uh, particularly uh, some of those techniques could also be thought to be creating yin or stimulating the creation of yin. So not at all contraindicated in hot conditions. So we've talked um, about a lot of different kind of techniques. Is there a technique that you'd like to focus on and describe uh, and, you know, describe to, to our viewers? Well, the most, probably the, what I would say the most flexible technique is the direct rice grains moxa technique. That probably has the, uh, the most uh, available uh, variations that you can adapt with uh, conditions and people and, and, and how your own skill to apply it. So, for example, you know, you can use that technique with a with a bamboo um, bamboo tube if you want, or you can use your fingers. Uh, you can extinguish it. You can put uh, something underneath it, like a, like a shunko cream, or or a you could create another base. Uh, you can modify that technique to be uh, very good for inflammatory conditions by making it thinner to a thread, or you can create that that mocks are slightly uh, uh, larger and allow it to produce a type of pinprick. So it's almost like a needle sensation rather than a heat, or you can allow it to be a little bit more. And for example, in Fukaya's tradition, he makes it a little longer with a bigger base and therefore it allows the heat to, to go in kind of deep. So there's a lot of variety. There's a lot of possibilities within the idea of direct direct moxa as rice grain moxa and that's probably one i love to use the most in clinic i'll incorporate it in a lot of ways and then i draw on the other stuff as i need to under special circumstances it's funny because rice grain moxa is the one that um people on the outside of japanese acupuncture kind of in some ways admire the most but feel as the most inaccessible because it, it requires a certain amount of manual dexterity so people mm. oh it's too fiddly for me i can't do that mm. but um you teach this all the time is it as hard as it looks well the there are ways of getting around that for example there are little cork boards or wooden boards that you can use to pre-roll your moxa and that's very easy anyone can do that you just basically just put the moxa in there and it just takes a little bit of practice to put rub these two pieces of wood together or cork board and then you'll get this nice long string and then you've got your moxa to pluck from so that's that's one way uh, when we teach it we do teach it from scratch so we teach it on a moxa board uh, to develop the skill. And then once the rolling skill is developed, we use uh, paper and we burn it on paper so that your ability to see how hot it burns. If it burns a hole in the paper, it would have burnt the tissue of the skin and you may not have wanted that. So, so there is a process of, of methodically learning it. Uh, and, and, and any skill is going to require that dedication. I, I, it is a skill-based system, but I don't think it should be so daunting for people. I think there is room for, for us to start using it. And even if we don't want to use it uh, as a rice grain, then you've got the Ibuki or platform moxa and the Kamaya minis. So there's ways of, uh, of doing it without necessarily developing the skill, but are still just as effective. Uh, in And so what you would do, for example, with a platform moxa is instead of doing three rounds of rice grain, the person would say hot and you'd lift it and then put it back on. And they say it's hot and you lift it again and put it back down hot and that's it. So that's like three, three rounds of moxa. So I think that, I think that once someone starts using it, they realize how did I, how did I, practice my clinical uh, methods with, you know, avoiding or not having this as part of my repertoire. Yeah. How did I ever do without it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's start to get specific because people watching this program, they've got loads of patients um, and they've got loads of patients with back pain. So how would we use rice grain moxa to treat back pain? Right. So there's, there's two approaches that I think are appropriate when you've got something like back pain. One is, of course, to determine whether it's an acute or chronic condition, and that will tell us a lot. But you can go directly to the local site, which is one way, or you can work distally. They're probably the two, in, in just in a general way, they would be my two most 
appropriate way. So, for example, lung 10, a point that we would never often think for back pain, is one of the greatest points to release back pain. And so this is a this is a point that you just very easy to find um, the alive point. Remembering that in Moxa we're looking for a point that is very reactive. We cannot use just an anatomical location for uh, you know for a point location uh, for for Moxa. So we look for this very tender point, which is not hard to find on on the thinner eminence. And uh, we can do this with the person face down and the palms, you know, with the hands by the side, palms up and very easy technique that will help with with back pain. OK, but let, otherwise... let, me, let me stop you there a second. So uh, you're saying that you're going to use a point like lung 10, uh, but you're going to press around all around the thinner eminence until you find a kind of an ouchie. Is that exactly. Right? Yes. Right. OK, so uh, it's not just dividing up this area in half and going, oh, that's halfway between the two. So I put the cone there. And are you going to palpate close to the bone or are you going to go right in, you know, more, more into yeah. the Yeah, so most moxa points are going to be closer to the bone because that's where you're going to find the greatest induration. So you're going to look around the bone. You're going to try to find that ouch, that point. There might be an induration or a hardness there, but, but definitely they'll feel that it's a strong pain when you press it and this pain is the is the live point and if you did it to, if you did it the next day it might move a few millimeters yeah. so this is what's important to realize with live points they have to be found at the time you're treating they're they're, they're not like a predetermined point you found that lung 10 is a good point for back pain it releases a lot of back pain, yes. Mm. And uh, it's connected. It's uh, The name translates to something like the belly of the fish or something like that. So it's, mm. it can be used also for digestive problems, but it's a great point for, for back pain. It seems to do quite well. The other aspect in the Japanese, particularly in the Japanese system, is that a lot of back pain is liver rather than kidney. So looking at uh, the way that the liver or the wood nourishes the muscles and tendons using wood points and moxering, you know, wood points that are going to be appropriate is another way of getting around, around that. Because typically, uh, I mean, as, as a generalization, mostly people will think of back pain with, in TCM as ki kidney primarily and, you know, go straight to the back and start treating and stimulating it. Now, if we wanted to treat locally, we could, but we could also look at uh, when we press on the back where the pain is the pain radiating. If the pain is radiating, we could go to where the pain is radiating and moxa at that site of radiation. Uh, we can also treat locally. It's not wrong to treat locally. It just depends because sometimes it can exacerbate the back pain. Mm. So particularly if there's a lot of inflammation in the joint. So um, what about knee pain? Is, is, is knee pain something that responds to moxa? And what would you do for knee pain? Look, knee pain's great. And in clinic, I, I, I love to actually, I'll combine acupuncture and the heat lamp with that. That actually works remarkably well for me. But you can do moxa around the borders of the knee. Uh, it, it requires, the reason I like to use the heat lamp is because it, it needs about, you know, 15 minutes or so of really deep penetrating heat. So if I'm not going to do that, then I'll usually work with my Nepalese moxa or I have a Lokwa moxa, which is in a special uh, round, uh, like a wooden contain, wooden circular device that with a stick that generates this very, very high heat as well. And so I'll use that. Usually you'll put something on the skin, like a little Japanese towel of some sort. You'll never use these, these uh, Nepalese moxa and the pole moxa on the skin directly. So you put this, you know, these, these, um, a towel and then this, um, uh, something that, uh, like a, a Japanese kind of, um, napkin -y, uh, handkerchief of sorts mm. and then you you would apply this on there and then you often will use your hand with a mitten that presses the heat deep into the knee so you'll um so you'll work around the knee doing this slowly and that has a remarkable effect on the knee but it does tend to need uh, and does respond very well with local heat uh, and unless it's an inflamed condition where you want to use thread moxa 
uh, if it's a chronic sort of debilitating degenerative type of knee pain, you definitely want something warming, hot and supportive and, uh, and the which knee loves just, it. Which is just going to bring lots of chi and blood into Lots the of knee. chi and blood to the area, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. So we've talked now about um, rice grain moxa and some other kinds of moxa as uh, a branch treatment, ways to treat symptoms. So, you know, you'll do your acupuncture and then you'll add your moxa. Is there a way in which moxa can be used to directly affect the overall regulation of chi and blood in the body as a root treatment? And when, when would you do that? These are known as Tai Chi treatments, and they are designed in uh, uh, what's called a general whole body uh, treatment, which is uh, a, not a specific pattern. So it's um, a non-pattern treatment or non-specific pattern treatment. But if you wanted to treat specifically, you could, and there are remarkable ways to do that. For example, you can uh, assess the, the five elements on the midline and you can determine the element that's out of, um, out of order by the most reactive, let's say it's the earth element, and determine the time that they're there, which is maybe they've come, happened to come at spleen time that morning. So now you're going to use the earth point on the spleen channel and you would mox at that point and you'll check again and that would clear that reactive area and that would be a root treatment because it would be treating the element that's most out of balance at that time of day in that moment in that person that's another way uh, we could use um, the supplementation and drainage points that uh, are opening and closing every two hours so that's another way or the 60 day and 10 day open points another way of doing it so there are ways of working in a very specific a specific manner that allows you to target the root treatment in accordance with something that you you see is important in that bo- in that person's constitution at that moment. Mm. So there, there are there are root, root treatments in that way. However, we wouldn't we wouldn't be um, exchanging a moxa treatment into a typical five element treatment that would be done with um, needles, for example. That wouldn't be an appropriate way. However, extraordinary vessels could be used. So the extraordinary vessels are easily supported in that way where you could find the extraordinary vessel that's most out of balance and you can use moxa, uh, placing more moxa on the master point and less moxa on the couple point. So, you know, three and two, for example, Mm. or two and one. So it's very versatile. You could be doing moxa with a person the whole throughout the whole session if you wanted to. Completely. So, so how do you integrate moxa into your practice? Because you're, you know, you're using needles uh, most of the time, but you're also using moxa. So how do, how do you marry them? Yeah. So uh, the majority of my treatment will incorporate following Dr. Menaka's ideas of of you know steps or in the protocol. So he had like five steps and. And so I, I do work a lot with polarity medicine and polarity technique. So I will incorporate always a polarity technique and, uh, or a marine therapy technique. And that will often be my starting point. And then in my second step, I'll use some kind of moxa technique or heating technique of some sort. If not, then I'll use it in my symptom control uh, and finish with my finish with moxa. That's often another nice way sitting them up and and uh, and using moxa. For example, on governor vessel fourteen um, with a cone, for, particularly for sensitive patients, just to allow them to you know leave feeling um, relaxed but not dopey. Mm. Yeah. So um, otherwise, if a person is generally. Uh, Adver- has adverse re- reactions or responses to needles. Maybe they're uh, maybe they're needle phobic, or maybe they're actually sen- quite sensitive patients. Then I just work with moxa completely, and I'll use these general whole body treatments with my moxa, mm. and incorporate um, you know front and back in that way. 
Mm. So that brings me on to another question, which is um, dosage. Because when I read in Mac, you know, in moxibustion books, they normally just say, oh, you know, three cones or three cones in my college was certainly that's what we did when we did cones. It was just do three. Mm. Uh, but then, you know, if you read Sung Beck, he says, do 200 cones on Ren 4. And I think, what, 200? Yeah. <laughs> that's going to take me half the morning. Um, so, I mean, what, 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 what does he mean when he says 200? Does he mean do 200 in the same session or does he mean 200 over a period of time? Or, and how many cones do you do? Is it always three or is it sometimes seven mm. or five? Or Yeah, it's a, it's, look, it's a very living system. So th there, there is usually two approaches. And one is that you use less points with more moxa or you use more points with less moxa. So dosage can be adjusted accordingly in that way. And if if you were only doing moxibustion, if that was the only thing you were doing when the person was coming to see you, and the point may need quite a lot of rounds. So there are scenarios where, yeah, you're actually doing, you know, 100, 200 or 40, 50 cones, but you're doing these uh, which are small rice grain. And so it's happening quite fast. It's not... Uh, that's why you have to develop the skill and the rhythm. And if you're doing them bilaterally, while one is burning, you're going to the other side and lighting that so that by the time you come back to extinguish the other one, then the other one and placing the new one, then you go back, etc. So the rhythm can develop so that it's not like you're waiting for one cone and then one cone and one cone. Mm -hmm. So you can develop that rhythm. In clinic, I usually will adapt depending what I'm doing. If I've used a lot of moxa during the treatment, I've usually used very few rounds. It could be one round per point. It could be three rounds per point. And if I haven't done a lot of moxa in that particular session, but I'm going to finish with something, then I might end up doing 15 or 17 on a particular point that I'm going to work on, maybe CV12 to finish with CV12 or CV6. Uh, two points I like to finish with a lot are um, large intestine 11 and stomach 36. It tends to draw out the, the heat from, uh, you know, from the body out to the, out to the limbs. And so it allows a person to, to, st to stimulate that circulation we want to achieve with the, with the moxa effect. So it's a, I, it's a nice way. So I'll either finish with the limb, with those limb points, or I'll finish with a belly point, or I'll finish uh, with them sitting up and doing something on the upper back. So let's talk about um, if you were going to recommend one kind of moxa, like, you know, if you said to someone, look, you've got to learn moxa, but if of all those things I've talked about, this is the one that I think would be, you know, really good for you, what would it be? What's your favorite? Oh, that's that's a very difficult question. I don't know if I if I could say I have a favorite. Uh, it would be very hard. Uh, yeah, I'm asking myself the same <laughs> question now. I don't think I could answer either. Unfair, but have a go. <laughs> but look, honestly, uh, if I had to say to someone to start somewhere, I would say uh, there's two possibilities. One would be to start with cone moxa, which I think is very safe and very versatile because you can use it to pack it tight and make it hot. So you can use it in contusions or to disperse things that are needing, needing to be sort of um, uh, dispersed because of congestion or stagnation. Or you can keep it loose for, for tonifying, you know, strengthening areas, or you can use it to correct overdosing and mistaken treatment. So it's very versatile. And then if, you, if, they, if they couldn't use that, then I would say probably to go something like a thermi warmer, like a tiger warmer, where they've got something where they've got heat. Uh, you know, the ontake would be a, another great one because both of them are using heat and pressure. So the ontake or the, or the uh, thermi warmer are going to be fantastic because you're, you're able to combine um, uh, heat without necessarily using the fire directly on the, on the skin and you can adapt that with um, with the rhythms of the channels. You can you know you can use it with children. You can stroke channels that you want to tonify um, in a meridian therapy way. So or stimulate a point with them in that way. Um, so again, a lot of versatility. And I think that's what's important is that once people realize how versatile moxa is, 
how safe it is, that it doesn't have to uh, burn the person and scar the person, that, and they'll see just how much patients enjoy it, well, you're going to find that you know, immediately they're going to uh, want to incorporate this in, into, their treatment, in, into their treatment protocols. So what you're saying is that MOXA is really important. <laughs> yeah. it's tr look there there are people for example like kawaii sensei who interprets the the character of the um i think if i the character of the needle i think he interprets it as a needle mo needle mox or something like that he mm. interprets that character meaning that there should always be moxer and needle well this would be one of the characters i mean i'm sure there are other characters that would mean other things but mm. in one the one that he focuses on he believes that that so he has this notion that he'll never use a needle without moxer so for him warm needle is done on every person and he doesn't actually consider rice grain or direct moxer as real moxer he sees that he, he kind of laughs at that uh, he laughed at that when he, he was alive and he he perceived that the real moxer was always a needle with moxer on that needle head and so you know he's he, he'd be putting moxer he'd be putting these needles and moxer in places we just wouldn't wouldn't feel comfortable you know needling with moxer on the mm. handle there but he did it wow Gosh, did he die of respiratory disease? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it can be very, smoke can be a problem if you're doing very, a lot of needle It was a very there. smoky environment, his room. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, where can people learn this stuff? I mean, yeah, uh, I, I, know, I know you teach in Australia in person, you do in-person moxa. And are there, I mean, people, for people who are not in Australia, are there online courses of MOXA that people can do? Well, my course at the moment is actually getting getting filmed to be an online course through Net of mm -hmm. Knowledge. So eventually uh, we've got one weekend up, but we keep getting interrupted. Our second weekend is nearly, nearly ready to go up. It's being edited at the moment. But the lockdowns because of the coronavirus uh, have unfortunately delayed our our uh, our course but uh, <laughs> yeah, i think every every acupuncture <laughs> teacher in the world watching this is nodding along right? uh you know yourself would be a great um resource as well um because of the ontake that you're teaching and have developed and and uh, in, you know modified into into such a a, a great uh, teaching tool as well as the um, Hirata Zone therapy that you're now brought into the awareness of the of the Moxa community, and um, of course there's uh, work that's being done by other great teachers, um, Philip um, Philip Codet from Spain and and um, Mitsu, Mitsu, uh, Junji Mitsutani in Canada, and you know there are great great teachers going around. It's becoming much more popular. Uh, the Japanese teachers. Uh, there are some of them that are venturing outside of Japan, of course, not at the moment, but, but there are some of them that have made um, trips outside of Japan. But I always encourage people to try to make the journey to Japan and have the opportunity to study with them directly. It's, it's something very unique to be in the environment there, studying uh, with them in, in, you know, in the setting uh, that uh, this lineage and tradition has been uh, developed for centuries now so you know there there are it's, it is becoming more i have to say it is becoming more popular and, it, and definitely we are seeing that uh, there's a greater and greater interest in it yeah for me there's a kind of there's a moxa revolution happening i think you know that people who are not acupuncturists, but are body workers like tween our practitioners, shiatsu practitioners are incorporating moxa into their practice as a way to hone their skills without going all the way and learning to insert needles. Mm. And that seems to be happening more and more worldwide. Um, and as you say, people like Philip in Spain, who's been teaching moxa so broadly across the world and um, Fukushima sensei, uh, and uh, Junji Mitsutani are really people who've been pioneering the use of moxa. And I think it's getting more and more uh, useful.
That's right, and of course, I, I not I wouldn't I would be amiss if I didn't mention Merlin Merlin Young, who's mm-hmm. done such a you know big effort to uh, generate the Moxa Africa and uh, the ability for people to learn how to do Moxa for themselves more more than just a, a practitioner learning to do it, but you know the, the the aspect of teaching people how to how to do it on themselves, which is one of the as aspects of the history of moxa which is often neglected when it's taught yeah the moxibustion in japan in particular was a people's medicine where people used to do it at home maybe not very well and that's maybe where it got its bad reputation from that's but right nevertheless an, an acupuncture merlin makes the point in his book was more like an aristocratic kind of uh intervention at first so that's right uh, yeah i i think um I would like to see Moxa become a home therapy again, where lots of people do it on their own using platform Moxa or um, on tag at home or uh, just kind of doing it on themselves and on their families with a little bit of guidance from their practitioner. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, no one's asking people to do needling at home, but they can definitely do Moxa. That's right. Even if they work with, uh, you know, platform moxa, for example, like uh, the Ibuki platform moxa is very safe, and there's no way with uh, that um, that platform that you're going to, you know, necessarily burn the skin if you if you're. I mean, you have to really mess up to do it, but um, but if you if you you know just use it as 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 it's recommended, then it's very safe. Okay, Paul, this has been a brilliant interview. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to our viewers before we close? Well, probably the, the th- when we were just talking a moment ago, what came to my mind was the realisation that, you know, Moxa does have uh, on many levels uh, in the West particularly uh, a negative connotation in in a lot of ways. For example, there was a recent paper that came out that described the toxicity to the lungs, and one of the main universities here uh, was presented that paper, and they took moxa out of the curriculum. And you know, that kind of fear mongering, I think, needs to go. I think we I think we need to start to. Uh, help the public and and of course through the through our patients and other practitioners and students that are graduating with uh, ongoing courses uh, postgraduate training I think that's where the strength of moxa is going to occur is going to happen in the clinics with patients loving it and saying to you know word of mouth of how relaxing and uh, wonderful and painless and enjoyable this technique was and they got better and to uh, allow in a, in the postgraduate world uh, people to realize that that there's still there's still a lot to learn that they haven't learned it all just because they've graduated and even if they're doing well in their clinic you can always do better because how do you measure what you know what is good you know i had one guy who told me that he felt he didn't need to do any training because all his patients got better. And I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, because they don't come back. And I'm like, well, that's not necessarily why they don't come back. They may not come back for other reasons. So, you know, how... Well, what could they be? <laughs> what, what could it be? Mm. So, um, but, you know, this idea in the West that we've learned it and... Uh, and then, you know, looking for quick fixes. Sometimes we go to workshops that have sort of quick fixes. I really want to encourage people to, to feel that we should always remain with the heart of being a student and want to learn. And it, it inspires us. It, it enlivens us. I mean, that's what, for me, I, that's, I, I continue to learn. I continue to find new teachers to, you know, to be exposed to their philosophy to you know to their energy to their lineage and uh, I will never stop learning and I I will never feel that I've I've done enough because this this wisdom in and of itself is um, you know it's it's infinite and so I would like to encourage people to you know to find a workshop wherever it is and, uh, and, and make the effort to, you know, to, to continue and go. And you'll get over the difficulty of, of rolling moxa. That's, that's, that's the least of the problems, you know. Then everything that is worthwhile is going to require a little bit of effort. So, 
Mm. Yeah. That's really inspiring, Paul. It's, it's, it's like saying, oh, well, I've learned the violin now. I don't need to practice. I mean, no one would say that. No musician no. would ever say that. Uh, and it's the same for us. You know, we haven't learned acupuncture. We've learned a small part of the huge, um, the huge broad repertoire that there is. And we can adapt more things to that suit our needs. Yeah. Well, that's been a wonderful interview. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so... Look- Thank you, Oren. I can't thank you enough for having me on. And yeah, it's a wonderful to have this conversation with you. And I hope that it's useful for people. Great. Thank you very much. So it's thank you from Paul in Australia. And thank you for watching from me in Taiwan. Thank you. <laughs>